to one ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the art of fuel podcast with myself anthony manuel i am joined today by one of my all-time favorite youtubers on the subject of health and nutrition bart k he is the og nutritional watchdog he is one of my like i said one of my favorite guys to listen to i have you know one of his streams on one of his videos playing probably for the last two and a half months every day just absorbing as much information about nutrition and, and exercise physiology as I can. Extremely knowledgeable human being sitting in front of me. Another good-looking bald carnivore. We have two good-looking bald carnivores in the chat today. And so I'm very, I'm very, very grateful, first of all, for you giving your time so graciously. You made me feel extremely underdressed in this situation. However, um, I'm very, very excited to kind of chat. For the audience, people who are new to you, I want to know what, a little bit about your background and how you came to some of the dietary conclusions that you've come to. So maybe just a brief overview to start. Uh, how did you come to a carnivore diet and what was your process with that? And I know there's, there's some academic background that kind of led you to this as well, not just personal experience. Yeah, right. Well, first of all, Anthony, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I do have to let you know that the particular dress today is not just for you. I'm doing another thing after this that required a bit more spiffiness, shall we say. I mean, I'm just as comfortable in a T-shirt or a sweatshirt or, you know, whatever as, as the next bloke. Um, but as it is, you know, sometimes... Um, when you when you're doing something um, that needs something a bit more spiffy, that's what happens. So, uh, in terms of my background, yeah, I um, in terms of the academic side of things, I am the holder of three advanced research degrees, um, which I've picked up over the years. Um, one is in the physiology of rest and exercise. Another one is in human nutrition. And the third one is in cardiovascular pathophysiology, which is a flash way of saying what causes heart disease, what doesn't, that sort of thing. Um, and that's all overarched by quite a significant um, knowledge base and uh, practical application of that knowledge base in terms of pure and applied statistics, statistical inference, science design, research um, design, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm the author of a relatively large number of peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, etc. And over a 25-year career in academia, I have taught probably 50,000 students at both undergraduate and postgraduate level at eight or nine different universities around the globe. Um, anyway, a few years ago, I gave all of that away because it was becoming less than what I wanted it to be. Um, and I wanted to to do my own thing more, actually, and to be my own, the master of my own destiny in terms of both financially and also um, the ability to communicate in the way I wanted to and say things about various topics that I wanted to say that I was having trouble doing in academia um, for reasons that academia is actually and has become something quite unlike what it's supposed to be. Um, mm. But that's for another day. I'd love to talk to you more about that as well because that's been uh, well, absolutely. On our, we can, on our biomechanics we can circle podcast. back to that. That's, yep. that's been, yeah, yeah. We can absolutely circle back to the problems of academia in in current times. But for what it's worth, that's my background. Um, so when I speak on physiology, biochemistry, human nutrition, exercise physiology, statistics, those kind of things. You can pretty much put it in the bank that I really do know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's that's that side of things. In terms of how I came across the carnivore diet, I had lifelong, really very quite serious, both physical and <laughs> mental health, psychological issues, right up until my mid-twenties, about half my life ago. Mm. And I tried everything, and I went through a bunch of, of different ways to try and deal with this in the standard medical model that is offered to people in, in most countries, including New Zealand, where I lived at the time, and again, having spent some time away, and now I'm back. 
Um, nothing worked. Nothing got my health sorted out. None of the advice I was given was the correct advice or really of any value or use to me at all. Um, and then it was about that time, about 25 years ago, that one of the several rounds of the resurgent of, of the resurgence of ketogenic diets, um, the Atkins approach, that kind of thing was rolling around again. And that was the first time it kind of came into my consciousness. And that was very early in my career as an academic. Um, it made sense to me at the time immediately because I knew full well that everything I'd been taught was false. I absolutely knew that. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose because my health is just absolutely abhorrent. And I went on the carnivore way of living. And within six months, pretty much my health went up to maybe 80% better. Mm. And I stayed what were some on that. Of the, go on. Can I ask, some? what were some of the qualitative improvements that you noticed? What were some of the tangible differences in, right. in over well, those six my, months? My specific health complaints were basically every single possible digestive disorder you could think of, I had at least part of the time or at least, you know, it, it, there's just about nothing you could name in terms of things that typically, typically go wrong in someone's digestive tract that I did not experience. As a function of that, as it turns out, my mental health, my psychological health was also very, very poor because those things are highly connected. There is a mechanism of that. It's underpinned by chronic systemic inflammation for most people, so that's what the issue was. And that was kind of 80% fixed, if you like, on a, on a ketogenic approach to life. And I stayed on that diet for the next 20 years until about seven or eight years ago maybe, when I heard about the um, the carnivore approach to living, which was that step further again on from the from the ketogenic, and that also made sense to me because I understood what the issues with the, c the consumption of plant materials were. My issue was I wasn't fully schooled up within myself on the fact that actually what we're told about the requirement for plants and plant materials in the diet is false and mm. fiber and all of that. We don't need any plant material or any fiber whatsoever in our diets, not one gram ever, to thrive and be healthy and to live our longest possible life and all of that. I heard the claims that that wasn't so. I was skeptical about them because obviously I was still, even at that stage of the belief, the typical belief. So I checked out what people were saying about what the evidence actually really did say. And I quickly came to the conclusion that those people were correct. The evidence does not support the need for plant material or fiber in any way, shape, or form in our diets. So I cut yeah. them out. I went carnivore. And that got me, and I went about 95% carnivore, and that got me close to 100% health, I thought. And I did that for five years or so until someone suggested to me that 95% carnivore was not 95% in terms of the health that you'll get from it. You need to go 100% to get 100% of the health benefits. So I did that and found out that that too was true, that a 5% transgression against carnivore diet really nets you much more of a penalty than 5%. So that's mm. where I sit today, for, for the understanding fully that 100% carnivore is the answer. And can we, for the sake of clarity of definition, how do you define an 100% carnivore diet? No plant material of any kind that contains either a plant toxin of any kind at all or contains um, starch or sugar of any kind. Plant extracts used nutraceutically or medicinally from time to time, that's not an issue, so long as the, the extracts that you're using do not contain any plant toxin. They need to have been mm. cleaned up and filtered professionally. They would be products. You, you probably mm. can't make safe, even plant 
derived teas and things by steeping teas and uh, that's not going to work. You're going to get some toxins. Uh, and there are very few companies that know how to remove these toxins because there are very few people that are aware of them even. Mm. Um, so 100% carnivore, strictly speaking, is no plant material of any kind passes your lips ever. In my life, in the reality of the world in which we find ourselves, I find myself tracking at about 95%. Because I've been known to enjoy the odd cup of coffee or tea. Mm. I've been known to put spices on my meat, you know, that kind of thing. I've been known to do all sorts of things like that from time to time. But the number I've come up with, I think, is pretty accurate. It's about 95% adherent. Mm. And, and the 5% transgression that I currently have, I have found out through experimentation N equals 1 on myself that those things that do come into my diet are not problematic for me. So I enjoy the hundred mm. percent health status, I guess. While still enjoying some coffee and tea and some herbs and things once in a while. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm. One question about the, the sugar element, right? Some people consider milk to be a part of a, a carnivore diet. Uh, because it comes from an animal. And so mm. some people kind of differentiate this idea of carnivore versus animal based. And, you know, one of the features of the carnivore diet that you just defined was no sugar. And there's obviously lactose that exists in milk. So things like cheeses are not as much of an issue if they're fatty cheeses with no carbs. But if you're drinking, you know, raw milk is a, is kind of a popular thing. Uh, would you consider raw milk something that is carnivore kosher or not so much because of the lactose and the carbohydrate content of it? It's an individual choice that a person has to make. Strictly speaking, by definition, milk is carnivore because it is sourced from an animal. Hmm. The problem with it, you've hit the nail on the head. Well, there are two problems. One is it contains a significant amount of sugar, which is contraindicated in the diet of a human being post weaning. Secondly, a lot of the human population, that's about two thirds of every human on the planet, has some degree, more or less, of intolerance to things that you will find in specifically bovine milk, mm. cow's milk. So there are, there are two reasons why someone might choose not to have milk in their diet. I'm one of those. I don't have milk in my diet. Um, partly because of the sugar thing, but actually most because I'm one of those two thirds that cannot drink milk. It's, it's mm. a problem for me. I react badly to it. I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't do it. But if, if you're a person who finds milk, either pasteurized or raw, is useful to you in some way, you swear by it, you wouldn't want to be without it, you think it's good for you, you don't react negatively that you're aware of, you're not carrying extra weight, fat on your body, hmm. then that's probably one of those things that's not broken and doesn't need fixing. That's your choice. We're not like vegans. We don't say there's one way to do it, this is the way you have to do it, and if you have any problems, then we're going to point at you and laugh and say, well, it's because you did it wrong. <laughs> It's uh, so I, I was vegan for two years. It was like probably the biggest lapse of judgment of my entire life. I really empathize when you were talking about this uh, it, gastric disorder kind of leading to mental health problems. I experienced that full force, just this continual degradation over two years of both my gastric state and my mental state. And it seemed to be like directly correlated. The worse my guts got, the worse my head got. And it was, um, it was shocking because again, all of these, uh, plant-based advocates with their studies and their, their, uh, you know, this is the only diet that'll reverse diabetes and reverse heart disease. And, you know, you kind of buy it hook, line and sinker if you don't know any better, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I did. And I suffered the consequences. And thankfully I was able to look at reality instead of just, YouTube videos of these people telling me, no, it's fine. You're healthy, even though you're suffering. So, um, I kind of want to circle back to this idea that sugar is contraindicated in the, in the human diet. And I, I would love to kind of dive a little bit into the physiology of why carbohydrates are a negative thing for human beings. 
there's a lot of arguments uh, in the circles that I'm a part of. They kind of fall into two camps. There's like the lower carb car carnivore oriented groups. Um, and when I say my group, I'm, I mean like people who are very into functional fitness, who are trying to find kind of the source code of how the human being is supposed to move, eat and live. And so there's the carnivore sort of lower carb keto kind of bi like evolutionary biology approach oriented approach. And then you have guys who are influenced by people like Ray Pete or people who kind of uh, claim exercise physiology in terms of you need glycogen for high intensity exercise. And, you know, carbohydrates are absolutely essential for the, you know, every cell in your body runs on glucose. So why would you, you know, go through the stressful process of gluconeogenesis instead of just eating some carbohydrates when you can digest carbs quickly and have that energy available to you quickly? So I'd love to dive a little bit into why carbohydrates are contraindicated in the human diet and why they might not, well, not only are not only, <clears throat> not only not necessary for athletic performance from an exercise physiology perspective, but could be harmful long-term for people's health. Yeah. Okay. So there's quite a few threads there, and then you can guide me through some of those conversationally if you like. I would like to start by saying straight away as a caveat to all of this mm. that I'm well aware of this movement of folks who identify as Ray Petians, those who follow the teachings of the late Ray Pete. And I'm not one who necessarily likes to speak ill of the dead. However, mm. I said exactly the same thing about him when he was alive. So why would I change it now? Ray Pete, I'm sorry to have to disabuse people that think he's great or was great in terms of his ideas. Ray Pete was an imbecile. There's no other way of putting it. Pretty much everything Ray Pete had to say about bioenergetics is demonstrably false absolutely mechanistically false. The man did not have a grasp of even first principles of biological functioning. My reasons for saying all of those things are covered at length on my channel when I speak about a thing called the Randall cycle. Mm. And I'll be doing yet another interview about the Randall cycle after this, in fact, for Judy Cho, hence the tie and nice. all of that kind of stuff. All right. So... <laughs> Sorry, Anthony, <laughs> but there you go. That's the way it is. Um, it's all for Judy. <laughs> it's all for Judy, all for Judy and her audience who are, you know, expecting a certain sort of thing. So anyway, there's that. Um, so that's Ray Pete dealt with. And if you want the details of why I have said such a thing about Ray Pete and you don't understand why I would say such a thing, then you need to binge watch all my videos and you will learn why. That's, that's very straightforward. Okay. Glucose, exogenous glucose, carbohydrates taken in in the diet. With the exception of fructose, fruit sugar, every form of, gluc of carbohydrate that you consume in your diet, if you do consume carbohydrates, irrespective of what it is, metabolically it's identical because it all breaks down to the exact same thing, and that is glucose. So to say good carbs, bad carbs, nonsense. It's like saying good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, nonsense. Mm. It is the exact same molecule that is produced by your body when you break down those carbohydrates ready for usage and transport in your bloodstream. It's glucose. Okay. Your body, the human body, has evolved according to positive and negative selection pressures, over it seems like probably the last four and one half million years, and absolutely definitely over the last 350,000, whereby our behavior, what we have done, how we have fed ourselves, is that we have eaten basically to all intents and purposes no carbohydrates. Mm. Our diet was entirely made up of the flesh and fat of mostly large ruminant animals. 
for the vast majority of the last 350,000 years at least, and probably four and a half million. That's what the anthropology tells us, the stable isotope testing of collagen derived from long bones of skeletal remains of humans found anywhere on the planet whatsoever of any age up to about 350,000 years old, which is when the earliest human remains have ever been found. Before that, we were proto-humans, different species that were nearly human, but not quite. Mm. So as such, those are the genes selected for. Those are how our organ systems are designed, and comparative anatomy and physiology backs this up. To anyone that understands comparative anatomy and physiology in the light of Darwinian evolution, and it all is in line, it all says that is what the human beings, that's what our diet was. As such, we have a metabolic pathway which allows us to produce glucose from non-glucose precursor. Mostly that precursor is the glycerol backbones of triacylglycerol molecules, fat. There is a second possible source that we can produce glucose from if there's no fat to speak of available, and that is from one or two amino acids, proteins, which can be used to make sugar in an emergency situation and only in an emergency to speak of, or unless you are consuming vastly too much protein, then some of it will go that way. That's the other option. Yeah. Also, we can make sugar from lactate, which is produced when muscle cells do their thing to produce force when we're exercising or yeah. hunting or moving really at all or being alive pretty much so we can make all the glucose we need all of it ourselves why have we evolved that way because for most of the last three hundred and fifty thousand years there weren't plants to be had they were all covered pretty much under a layer of ice several miles thick over almost the entirety of the planet those plants that were available were largely almost entirely fibrous tubers and rooty type things that we had to dig up and boil for hours and hours to break down those fibers enough that we could put them in our guts and a few bacteria that lived there were able to break down some of that material and produce a very small amount of, as it turns out, short chain fatty acids, not glucose. They have no glucose in them to speak of. The, the <coughs> potatoes and sweet potatoes and those kind of things that you can buy today from the supermarket or the greengrocer or whatever, they're actually human inventions. They are selectively bred to be full of carbohydrates. This is all agrarian revolution since the agrarian revolution stuff. So it's really only been about the last 10,000 years that we've, met, we've eaten any amount of carbohydrate at all. And it's been absolutely disastrous. It's the second worst thing human beings ever did in terms of diet is to add plants in. Mostly because plants are what's full the, of toxins. What's the first? The first one was adding seed oils, industrial seed oil. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, absolutely the worst thing we ever did nutrition-wise. The second worst was adding carbohydrates. So that's, that's the situation on that. Carbohydrates taken in exogenously, we have the capacity to break carbohydrates into glucose because there's no negative selection pressure or was no negative selection pressure to knock that gene out. Because mm. the word so, carbohydrates so the we had. The, the, the proto-humans that you were talking about were more herbivorous, they more ingested carbohydrates. That's probably why we still have the amylase. Yeah, you, 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 have to go back about, you have to go back about five million years to find a herbivorous proto-human that lived in trees, ate leaves and fruits when they were available for a couple of weeks during the year. Pretty much as soon as mm -hmm. we came down so from the trees about five million years ago, we stood upright, said, oh, look at these tasty looking beasties. Let's go and eat those. And that's what we went and did from that point, pretty much. So over the next 500,000 years, we switched entirely from a plant-based diet to an animal-based diet. It was also during that, the thing that actually caused us to come down from the trees really and start hunting animals was necessity. The planet froze over. Mm. All the trees died. Pretty much all the and grasses so and yeah, all of that. 
So that, that switch in diet predominantly is probably what drove that branch off evolutionarily from the proto-human to what we're now calling Homo sapiens. Hey, yes, like that, and drop the that, that's a it's, pretty. But it's, it's an absolute slam dunk. And that is it's what unequivocal. Happened. Yeah, it's unequivocal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So from that point on, we were committed to a pathway of animal nutrition, and that's hmm. how we have lived right up until ten thousand years ago when we thought, oh. It's currently warm. Grasses are growing well. This hunting lark's getting a bit old. Let's plant a bunch of grasses, eat their seeds, maybe domesticate some animals, get them to plough the fields for us. While we're at it, let's live on their lactations because that's yummy stuff. It's got sugar in it, so it must be great. Um, yeah, this will be no problem. This will this will be the best thing we ever did. No, second worst thing we ever did. The exact mm. dietary requirement in a human being for glucose carbohydrate is none, not one gram ever. That is an unequivocal fact. No human being requires carbohydrate to live at all, any amount of carbohydrate. Um, and I'm talking about those carbs that break down to glucose directly. There is one form of carbohydrate, which I mentioned before, fructose, fruit sugar, which doesn't mm -hmm. break down to glucose so much. That one is dealt with differently by the liver. It's, it's metabolized directly to fat. And that's even worse. Number one, because mm. it leads to fatty liver if you take too much fructose in. And number two, it raises your trace or glycerol level in your blood, your fat in your blood, and that's not a good thing. Plus, it also causes seven to ten times as much damage to your tissues as pure glucose mm. does. Glucose is actually can we talk toxic. about? Yeah, can we can we talk about how glucose causes tissue damage a little bit? Like yes. dive a little bit more into the physiology of that because that's something sure. that I yep. still have a hard time explaining to people. And so maybe if I hear you and then I can kind of translate it into layman terms in my own Go mind. On. Well, I'll I, give it to I'll, you in layman's to... terms. I'll boil it down to its lowest common denominator. It's it's quite simple. Sugar, when its concentration rises in the blood and in the cell fluids above a physiologically indicated level, that glucose starts to chemically bind to protein structures, to cell structures, to organelles, to fats, to other bits and bobs that need to be a certain kind of chemical to do their job effectively in the human body. And it chemically alters those things to something different. It becomes a protein plus this sugar side chain that's been appended to it. Mm. And it's that which causes the destruction of the um, proteins and cell structures and fats and things in, in the human body, which leads to chronic systemic inflammation, systemic failure of your health, robustitude, your longevity. It'll kill you, basically. Mm. And that, that's, a, that's glycation? Is that what that process yeah, it's is? it's called glycation, exactly. Mm. And what I'm suggesting to you about fructose is that it's seven to ten times more likely to cause glycative damage to your tissues than pure glucose is. Hmm. So to say fructose so all this, is great uh, fruit this sugar, yeah. fruit sugar and honey. Yeah. That's uh that's that's probably a no go. It's absolute again, take the word probably out. <laughs> it is absolutely right. <laughs> unequivocally Unequivocally. Yes. Mm. If you want some N equals one anecdotal even on that I mean, the science is fine. If you want to go and look it up, you can look up what I've been saying about, you know, damage to cells by fructose and all of that kind of stuff. Take a look at a video made just two years ago by one individual who identifies as a physician, even though he's not one. I know who you're going to say. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to exactly say a physician. I'm just going to say a physician who identifies <laughs> as a physician when he really isn't one, who... Two years ago, I made a video called What I Eat in a Day, and at that time, what he did eat in a day was meat and animal fat, and he appears at that time to be probably five to maybe seven years younger than he actually was at that time. That was, what, that was how he looked. Mm. Okay. It's pretty, pretty advanced aging. Well, you um, look at the same individual now, two years later, making mm -hmm. videos still only now he's saying you should eat meat and fat but also you should pour 400 grams of carbohydrates down your stupid neck every day 
in the form of both (laughs) fructose and glucose, Mm -hmm. have a look at how the boy looks now. Now he looks 10 years Mm -hmm. older than he is. So what we're talking about is a 20-year apparent physiological aging process that has occurred in two. Mm. And he's just one. If you want to look at how well people do on a diet based entirely on plant materials, just go and have a look at any of these vegan promoters. Oh, I know. (laughs) And ask yourself the question, is this somebody that I would like to take health advice from on the basis of how do these people appear health-wise? Mm. And if you do, well, that's Darwin think- in action too. That's your funeral. You go and do that. <laughs> that's fine. Right. Enough said. I think um, I'm just going to say his name. Paul Zeladino is, is a fellow who's kind of irked me a long time. I, I, I found even when he was pure carnivore, he over-promoted the consumption of animal organs. And yeah, I actually think that – Right. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but I, I really don't, I don't uh, like even, even when I was like peripherally interested in carnivore as, as something that I hadn't even tried yet, I had this gut feeling about, pardon the pun, a gut feeling about the fact that if you're consuming these hypernutrient dense animal organs all the time, that if your if your whole argument is that it's like evolutionary biology and it would have been what our ancestors ate, but the, the ratio of organ meat to muscle and fat is so low Mm. and it was like you're you're kind of misbalancing the ratios you're probably going to have like some sort of hyper vitaminosis or some sort of electrolyte issue i know like it's suit like sky high in copper and 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 it's funny because paul was complaining about electrolyte imbalances it's like well dude you're you're mucking back how much raw liver and then powdered liver and then like desiccated mm-hmm. everything else that you can get your hands on. And mm-hmm. well, no kidding you, uh, you felt like your body was stressed out and you needed to add yeah. in carbohydrates to appear Plus less he was stressed. Consuming, he was also consuming insufficient protein for his individual needs as a very active mm. young man at the time. Plus, he wasn't eating all his protein in one meal a day, which you need to do. So as a result of that and his abuse of intaking vastly too much specifically liver and desiccated liver on top of that because of his deal with the ever so, ever so um, trustworthy liver king, (laughs) Teehee. Yes, Paul Saladino was in bed with that bloke in business. Mm -hmm. Yes. What happened was his kidneys became very, very leaky to electrolytes and he lost his electrolytes and that's what caused his problem. So now he thinks the solution to that is to pour sugar down his neck, which will absolutely tighten up those those kidneys, you bet. But the trade-off for that is you're now destroying his body with with carbohydrates very, very mm. rapidly. Instead of dealing with the problem, which was stop with the organs and eat sufficient protein in one meal a day. That's all he needed so, to do. Can we, can we talk about that point, the one meal a day thing? Because... Yeah. Um, why would it be beneficial to eat all your protein, all your food, all your calories? Well, not, we, we, we don't believe in calories here. We don't use um, the C word. Goodness. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And we can, we can get into why after, but why yeah. is it beneficial to eat all of your protein in a single meal from a health perspective? Right. The reason for it is because if you take in sufficient protein in one meal, you'll absorb the vast majority of that in the form of amino acids that will go into your amino acid pool and be used later for inclusion in your body structures. There will be an amount left over if you eat sufficient protein, which will be converted, some of it, to some glucose as I alluded to earlier with the gluconeogenic pathway. Mm -hmm. And also, some of those amino acids are also directly what we call insulinogenic as well. What you're looking for is an insulin response during the day that goes do 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 What you're not looking for is an insulin response that goes beep all day. Yeah. That's the thing, that insulin release is the thing that 
your kidneys react to that insulin in such a way as to maintain their ability to filter electrolytes back in and mm. not lose them to the urine, basically. That's as opposed to a, a, an insulin response that goes... Doo -doo -doo, boom, three or four or five meals a day of sugar containing nonsense. That's contraindicated. Mm. But you do want that. And if you spread all your protein out in three or four or five meals a day and never take a decent bolus of protein in any one meal, you will get a flatline insulin response and your electrolytes will suffer. Mm. That's that one in a nutshell. And so by so so I have a couple of questions from from an exercise physiology perspective, right? Is mm -hmm. is that going to be adequate to produce energy if you're say eating all your food in one meal, you have like a large large dinner, you're eating a couple of pounds of steak. Mm -hmm. Um the next day you wake up and you you have to go train and you're mm -hmm. you know like this is something that I was really concerned about shifting from uh, you know, a diet that included carbohydrates to now, you know, I'm a full week pure carnivore and I feel amazing. And my performance in the gym is actually startlingly high. It's one of those like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, great. I was lied to again. And I was totally wrong about everything. What else is new, but why? <laughs> okay, so, so you've just, yeah, you, you've answered your own question about whether we do need carbohydrates for exercise performance as in, do we need mm -hmm. carbohydrates in our diet? The answer is no, still not right. one gram ever zero. Gluconeogenesis is a process by which your body will produce as much glucose as is required by your body. When you, have, when you train your muscles, when you train your body physically by doing exercise, one of the things that occurs is that your resting level of muscle glycogen, which is glucose starch in your muscles, that goes up. Mm. So... When you exercise, when you contract a muscle, there is no way that any muscle fiber of any muscle fiber type anywhere in your body can contract, not even once, without using glycogen as the fuel source. Mm -hmm. It is fundamentally a part of the mechanistics of how a muscle fiber contracts. Remove glycogen from a muscle fiber it will not work. It will not contract. In fact, it will become necrotic. It will die. Okay? So we need, a, we need to get glucose into the muscle cell from the bloodstream to build that glycogen. That doesn't mean we need to eat carbohydrates to put glucose in your bloodstream because gluconeogenesis does it. So if you exercise and your muscles go, oh, I need more glucose to build more glycogen because I've trained, then it will draw that glucose out of the blood and then your body will mm. sense that the glucose is getting drawn out of your blood and it will put more there by gluconeogenesis and it will make that glucose from the fat that you ate. So, so this sounds like more of an endogenous rather than an exogenous approach, right? So when people are saying, well, you need carbohydrates, it's like, well, you know, yeah, you need testosterone. Does that mean you're going to be pinning testosterone the way that Liver King does? You know, mm. uh, you need carbohydrates. No, no, he's natural. To... It's all natural and it's down to liver pills he was <laughs> taking, <natty>. remember? <laughs> mm. Just eat three testicles a day and you're good to go, right? So, hey, Well, yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Still, even, even athletes, even athletes who undertake mm. high-intensity burst and repeat sports – that most exercise physiologists will tell you requires you to consume carbohydrates in your diet, still nonsense, still not true, mm. false. Not one gram ever is required in your diet, ever. Even you, athletes. Well, mm. Mm. And and I, I have been – well, I mean, like the first carnivore that I interviewed was Dr. Sean Baker, who is an absolute machine. And he was like, hey, look, this is this is the training that I do. It's extremely glycolytic. It's high intensity rowing. I'm deadlifting. I'm doing all this crazy stuff. I don't eat. I haven't had a gram of carbohydrate in years, right? Like it's like I'm just mm. eating ribeyes. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. all. Dr. Anthony Chafee, same thing. Mm -hmm. He switched to a carnivore diet and he was like, I couldn't fatigue myself. Like it's like my body was always producing the exact amount 
of energy. So there's almost like this adaptive metabolism yes. when you're producing this, this metabolic response endogenously versus you're trying to fuel yourself exogenously with this carbohydrate. This is, this is kind of what I picked up on it. And you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but mm. like what I, what I interpreted is like, okay, so your body like learns to generate the required energy when it's not getting this energy from an external source, yes. your body becomes more adaptive and more resilient and more able to handle stress yes. just by its own chemical processes, as opposed to if you're taking in this carbohydrate all the time, spiking yes. insulin, doing all this other stuff. Yes. Super, super interesting to me. Yeah, true. Absolutely. But also to add to that, your body is even more resilient, efficient, does what it, sh it should do when it should do it, even more effectively if you stop poisoning your body. And the way to poison your body is twofold. Number one, carbohydrate, exogenous carbohydrate in your diet of any kind. That is metabolic poison every time. Secondly, where do you get carbohydrates? Well, you get it from plants, and plants also contain a whole suite of other toxins that the plant puts there with malice aforethought in order to try and discourage animals from eating it. Mm. So... Don't do it. What, um, you know, in terms of the most common plant toxins that you see people consuming, like there's, there's the obvious offenders like the oxalate and spinach and kale. And mm -hmm. I think no one really, you know, but like in terms of uh, other than the carbohydrate, are, are, are there any concerns with things like fruit? Are there concerns with um, just less insidious sounding, you know, like a lot of people are like, well, I cut out vegetables. I feel great. Mm. What are the other sort of plant toxins that people would have to kind of consider beyond just the, the okay. obvious, you yeah. know, ditch okay. the So the obvious ones are exogenous carbohydrate. It is toxic. Mm -hmm. Fiber. Mm. Dietary fiber is toxic, is destructive to your enteric function, is pro-inflammatory, will compromise your health at some point. Probably immediately, but in some people it takes a while. Nonetheless, it will. Fiber is toxic. Oxalate you mentioned. Tannic acids, phytates, deadly nightshades, lectins. There's a whole suite of these I could go on all day. Mm. Most of them are put there by plants as a response to positive and negative selection pressures, most of those toxins are designed to kill insects rapidly. And they do, effectively, mm. most of them. Of course, the insects respond by evolving in such a way as to have ways of dealing with that. The higher animals, most plant toxins won't kill a higher animal, stone dead on the spot, pretty much. Some will. Still, actually, some absolutely mm. will. Most plant toxins are not immediately fatal to a higher animal like a human being. But nonetheless, over a lifetime, which will be shorter if you tox, if you fill yourself with such toxins, they will kill you. You will go to your grave sooner than you would have otherwise done because of that toxic load. There's no two ways about that in my mind at all. Mm. You are not evolved or designed by, by evolutionary process to consume any amount of plant material whatsoever, or carbohydrate, or fiber. All of those things will shorten your life, will compromise your health span, and will destroy your experience of the world, or at least vastly reduce it. So what if I have a, a bro who comes up and says, yo, but like, what about hormesis? What about the positive stress? That like when I eat these toxins, like my body has an adaptive response. I, I saw Dr. Rhonda Patrick on Joe Rogan, bro. I got to eat those broccoli sprouts, man. Yeah. yeah, Rhonda Patrick is another imbecile. I'm sorry. I'm a <laughs> complete imbecile. Um, and let's face it, her only claim to fame, the only reason that she has any public profile at all is because of her friendship with Joe Rogan. Nothing to do with does she know what she's talking about, because she does not at all. Stress is indicated in life. Your body will respond to some stressors 
in a positive way by repairing itself and making itself better than it was before. All toxins really fall into the, the old adage of it's the dose that makes the poison. And all various toxins have their individual levels at which they become problematic for an individual human being. That's just the way of it. Most plant toxins are cumulative. Mm. So the longer you eat small amounts of this toxin, and I'm thinking the most common one of those is oxalate, it will build up and build up and build mm. up and build up in your system until suddenly you have an amount of oxalate in your system that will tear your health down and rapidly. Because because oxalate crystallizes too, right? Like it can, mm. what are, what are some of the, the buildup effects of, of too much oxalate in someone's system? Well, the is most that a kidney common, stone issue? Yeah. The most common one is kidney stones, which when you say kidney stones, people think a kidney stone is kind of a, a smooth pebble shaped thing. Oh, it's a stone in your kidney. No, they're like sharp, pointy needle crystal star shaped things. They pierce the cells of wherever they're building up. And it's not just kidneys. Oxalate can crystallize and build up in any tissue in your body, thus piercing those tissues with crystals and causing inflammation and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. Any tissue at all in your body, including you know, I've heard of people that have oxalate issues where they have oxalate crystals forming in their eyeballs. Oh, my Lord. Mm. Well, here's another real common so, one. The epithelial <sighs> linings of your blood vessels. Mm. It's one of the most common causes of atherosclerosis, in fact. Interesting. Mm. So, it's not, so it's not the saturated fat and cholesterol is what we you're saying. It's, it's not those, that. Those that's, that's also unequivocal. This is not even a debate anymore. There are still people no. claiming that cholesterol and saturated fat is causal in heart disease. They are wrong. Which it is they, not. They are wrong. It is. They are unequivocally, absolutely wrong. Neither of those things cause heart disease. Not at all. Ever. You know, was that whole fiasco, that whole misinterpretation, was that strictly? Do you think Ansel Keys' fault? Essentially, he started it. Mm -hmm. So it was his fault. However, the market forces that were brought to bear at that time, his ideas gained traction because of his um, criminally misanthropic um, cherry picking of his data in order to subsume mm -hmm. his own feathering of his own nest. And a bunch of pharmaceutical companies jumped on that and started generating drugs that would affect cholesterol and then those companies spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on buying off the medical fraternity and the scientific fraternity. And that's how it becomes, like any lie, the way to get a lie to be accepted by the public at large is to say it with authority enough times. Safe and effective, well, this safe is... and effective, effective and safe, safe and effective, safe and effective would be an example from recent mm -hmm. events. Yes. And we know that we know that the truth of the matter is that safe and effective are both false. Both demonstrably, absolutely, unequivocally false. And let's not talk about it because it gets shadow banned. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> those those are uh, the yeah, facts safe on and that effective issue. Is, is, it's like it's like a hypnotic mantra that you yes. that you hear over and over again. Yes, such so that is bad. Is the... okay. Cholesterol <laughs> well, is bad. Is... Okay. No, it isn't. False. The... Well, I, I certainly have to agree. I mean, like my whole diet for the last several years has been oriented around saturated fat and cholesterol, and I feel fantastic, mm. especially after not having it for two years on a vegan diet. So uh, my hormonal health and well, just my health in general has been exceptional since then. Yeah. But yeah. this is uh, an interesting segue kind of back into a, an earlier point in our conversation about some of the limitations or uh, issues within academia in terms mm. of trying to ascertain truth. Mm. Um, you know, one of these, po these things where it's like an academic consensus is that saturated fat 
causes cholesterol. That was the, an academic consensus for quite some time. And what are, what are some of the issues that you see within academia that could inhibit a person from ascertaining truth just as like if they're appealing to the authority of, of mm. acad uh, academics or they're appealing yeah. to the authority of science as an institution, not as a method, mm. but as an institution, mm. what are some of the limitations and issues with that? Okay. Appeal to consensus fallacy is one of the biggest mistakes that any person can make when looking for truth. Because it matters actually not one jot how many people believe a thing to be true, if in reality that thing is untrue. Now here's an example of that, just so that people can grasp it very easily. At one point, the purported, purported consensus was that the earth is flat, the sun revolves around the earth, which is fixed and immutable, and we are the center of the universe. Having been granted that special um, privilege, I guess, by God himself. And anyone who said otherwise was silenced, and the way they silenced them at that time, of course, was to tie them to a tree and set them alight. Heretic. Witch. Mm -hmm. For example. Today, we think that our society is so much more advanced from that. We don't tie people to a tree and burn them so much anymore. It does still happen, by the way, in certain cultures. But we think that science has enlightened us and, and you know, we, we now have truth on our side and we can understand what the truth is. Except you've just said yourself, Anthony, that the consensus, at least for a goodly number of years, was that saturated fat and cholesterol was the cause of heart disease. It was a purported consensus. Because anyone who said otherwise, academically was tied to a tree and set on fire academically. Mm. The way to determine truth as communicated via the scientific methodology and scientific reporting is this. You, as the consumer of that information, that science, it is your responsibility to make an assessment on the veracity of any claim made in any scientific paper by yourself reading the numbers. Science is informed empirically with numbers, that means. Mm. A scientist will design a project, apply certain disciplines like controlling confounders, covariates, collinearities, those kind of things that would undercut the veracity of the study. They hold everything constant and allow one variable to, to vary freely, or indeed they experimentally change it from one thing to another. And they look at the effect of that on an outcome variable. Then they report what they found with their statistics, and they provide their workings on their statistical inference. And then they write some words about what their numbers say. Except here's the problem, or well, several problems. Number one, most people can't read those numbers and interpret them and know what they in fact do say. So they have to mm -hmm. take the word of the authors who have said, now that you've seen these numbers in this table, don't bother because we're, we're the good at grown-ups at science. Just trust us. Trust the science. We're the science. Here's what those numbers say. And then I'll give you some words as to what they are purporting that their numbers say. Guess who pays the scientists, industry, scientists are funded by industry. So if you give mm. me several million dollars and you, you represent a food manufacturing company and you give me several million dollars to do a study on whether or not the product you are making is dangerous to people, then I will go through the motions of setting up a rigorous so-called scientific design, which will actually be designed to find what I want to find statistically. And then I'll find that, and then it will say what it says, probably with not very much power or veracity anyway, to be fair. And then I will write a paragraph about what my numbers say, according to me, which has been paid for by the several million dollars you've just given me. 
to say this is a great product. Right. And then, of course, the general public has no choice but to take my word for it because they don't know how to do those statistics, let alone what they say. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is it's your responsibility. If you want to say science says, then Mm. you better be a scientist who can read those numbers and you better be prepared to defend yourself against someone like, say, myself, who will say, okay, you're saying science says. Why don't you appear on my channel live on camera and we'll see whether science does say that or whether it doesn't, shall we? Mm. Otherwise, don't don't make comments publicly, science says, because you have no idea what science says. That's where this the problem is. Um, th- this is a, something that we, you know, like we, when we're looking at exercise um, mechanics mm. and testing different uh, elements within biomechanics, this is something that's come up a lot where um, a lot of functional fitness trainers are put under scrutiny by evidence-based physiotherapists and chiropractors and what have mm. you saying that there's no veracity to the claims that they're making, even though there's demonstrable, they, they, they dismiss it as just anecdotes, even though they mm. have thousands upon thousands of results with clients demonstrating a change in their, their movement behaviors and their mechanics mm. at which like observable changes, but because there's no peer reviewed medical evidence to suggest otherwise to suggest that their methods Mm. or their proprietary systems actually create change is dismissed entirely as like non-scientific and is not valid as Mm. information within the fitness field which is frustrating beyond that when we've been presented with scientific papers discrediting the functional fitness systems the first thing that my my co-host and i do is we go in and we look at the study methods and 90% of the time, they're not accounting for any relevant variables. They're not accounting for, uh, they're, they're, they're operating on flawed first principles because they're, they're kind of within their own framework of understanding in the mm. same way that a person who would be studying heart disease in the, the saturated fat or cholesterol heart hypothesis, they would only be studying within that framework. So they have this sort of pre-established notion of what, uh, I guess like pre-assumptions that they have to have as true before they start studying. And so there's this whole other realm of information that's just not considered within the field of biomechanics and fitness Mm. um, because they're just not accounting for relevant variables as it pertains to human movements, the way the human body actually moves in three-dimensional space. Um, And so it's really frustrating to have these conversations with people who are, who are so stuck in this box of, well, the academia says this, the science says this, but it's funny because a, it doesn't, Mm -hmm. if you actually just, you know, you don't even need to be a stats, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to be fluent in statistics to even go in and just look at the method section and be like, how, how is this person jumping off a box for six weeks relevant to what's happening within a person's joints and, you know, with the, the, the actual fluid dynamics of fascia and the viscoelastic properties of what we're proposing here, like there's no, there's no relevance whatsoever. So I guess a question that I would have for you is as a consumer who wants to be responsible, who wants to basically be able to look and find truth themselves, is it necessary to learn statistics? Is it necessary to go through a formal academic I guess, education so that you can be, I guess, literate, scientifically literate at least, and be able to interpret this stuff yourself? Or is there uh, some hope for the layperson in terms of how to determine and ascertain truth without having to go down a formal academic route? I think the former, I think you really do have to go through some formal training in statistical inference, methodology of statistics, research, design, ethics, all of that, to remotely be able to understand what a research project has done or not done. Hmm. You cannot, just because you might understand the words or even most of the words in a science paper, you as a member of the general public you may think you can pick up that paper and read it and understand it. Without that training, I'm sorry to disabuse you of that notion. You can't. I do what I do based on more than a quarter of a century of involvement with the science as a producer of science, as a 
research mm. scientist with a large number of publications in my name, having done thousands of statistical analyses on data sets. Just because you can read some words bigger than wheelbarrow does not make you competent to read a science paper, much less make a video on YouTube about what a science paper says and says <laughs> or proves. And as such, you people that are doing that, that do not have the background I've got, you should not be doing that. You are out of your lane. You have no business doing that. Any more that I should come online and say, well, I've read a few papers on proctology. <sighs> Set myself up with a proctology clinic. Fair enough. No. Amateur psycho psychiatrist, if you like, I'll do that. I know an amateur psychiatrist. He's also, an, an, he's also an amateur physician. He claims to be both because he's done two mm. rotations, one in general medicine and, and, and one in psychiatry. He's never practiced medicine in his life. And he's coming online talking about what the science says, and he says that the science says it's okay to pour 400 grams of carbohydrates down your stupid neck every day of your life. Is that okay for him to be doing that? No. The boy doesn't know how to read a science paper, let alone tell us what it says. So in, in this case, as the consumer, it seems like you either have to go down an academic road yourself and be, be basically become a scientist, become a, mm -hmm. someone who is fluent in statistics and, and mm -hmm. have that level of understanding of statistical inference. Yeah. Or if you don't have the time, the time to do that, what is the alternative? Do you defer to an authority? Do you defer to an expert? And if so... What are the levels of qualification that you look for to find someone who is legitimate in terms of their expertise that you can trust enough to outsource your beliefs to? You right. know, if you're going to basically take the word of someone yeah. because you basically you acknowledge, okay, I'm not qualified. I don't know what the hell this stuff means. I can read it, but like realistically, I'm probably going to misinterpret it because I'm not, this is a language I don't speak. How do you find someone who you can trust? Right. You go to my YouTube channel and you binge watch everything I've ever produced. When you've done that, you go to my Odyssey channel and you binge watch everything on that channel as well. There are 1,300 or more videos that I've produced over the years. If you want to get an understanding of how a competent scientist thinks and interprets the works of others, you need to watch every single one of those videos, however long it takes. <laughs> In terms of others who have the same level of authority in my mind as I have in this field or these fields, I couldn't give you one name, not one. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying go to my stuff. If you find my stuff too challenging, too abrasive, too sweary, because I do use short words quite often on my channel or my various offerings in the past more so than now, but it is there including C words, and I don't mean calories. Okay, it, it is there, so just be warned. Um, if you find that too challenging, there are several folks that I would suggest are very good sources of information. Not on my level, but very, very good sources of information on matters of exercise and or nutrition variously and collectively. And the names that come to mind immediately are folks like Dr. Sean Baker, Dr. Anthony Chafee, um, and one or two others. Yeah, that's, they're the people that you'll find that I haven't debunked on my channel. Right. <laughs> No qualms with anything that they have to That's say, right. basically. So if you can't find me bagging one of those people, at least in one video, it's likely that either they haven't yet come to my attention or they're okay. Right on. Mm. And so I have binge watched most of your YouTube channel now. I'm, I'm, now that I have your Odyssey channel bookmarked, I, uh, I have a whole other Odyssey to go down. Yep. And... <sighs> This is 
you know, I, I, this is kind of why I wanted to have a conversation with you in person as well is because there's, you know, there's so many questions that as, as a consumer, as a lay person, um, you know, my, my approach was, Hey, I'm going to become a podcaster. And then I'm going to invite all of these people who are way smarter than I am, who have way more education. And I'm going to consolidate my time basically, and learn as much as I can from these very qualified people about how my body is supposed to work, how nutrition is supposed to work, how me my mechanics are supposed to work. And, um, and that, that's been very, very effective. And I hope for the most part, these podcasts that I've been putting out for people, if they're listening, that they've been informative in some way. And they've really, you know, like my goal has always been to help people improve their quality of critical thinking as it pertains to the massive amounts of shit on the internet. And there's a lot of it, especially, you know, in the fields of nutrition, in the fields of functional fitness and biomechanics, there is so much conjecture. There's so much airy fairy fluff. There's so much mythology and, and just garbage. Um, you know, I'm kind of mad at myself at this point that it took me this long to try a carnivore diet, <laughs> to be honest. And I think I got some really, really good information, even just from this conversation in terms of how I could sort of tweak it even more to, to feel even better. Cause I feel amazing right now. I felt like shit the first three days coming off coffee and going through carbohydrate withdrawal. Right. And I felt, I felt terrible, but I feel amazing, you know, just like seven or eight days in now. And it, it kind of really boggles my mind. So the two tweaks that, uh, that I kind of heard, uh, are maybe I don't need to be consuming as much throughout the day. And if I can try to consolidate all of my protein into one meal, so I get that nice insulin bump near the end of the day. Um, does that mean during the day doesn't have to be at the end, right? Yeah. Just w at one point during the day, you yes. don't want to, you don't want to bump that insulin more than once during the day. Yeah. And then does that mean that you're completely fasting? This is like a pure fasting OMAD approach. Can you eat fats throughout the day? Um, what's, what's your take on that in terms of, Optimal health, optimal performance. Okay, OMAD means just that, one meal. Mm -hmm. Your intakes of nutrition happen in one sitting. You don't need snacks. You don't need anything during that. You're not going to drop dead during the day because you haven't eaten every few hours. Secondly, fasting, my operational definition of fasting is that it begins at around about 72 hours of no food. Mm. Strictly speaking, by definition fasting is any amount of time when you're not eating so the minute the very minute you finish eating your fast begins until you next eat even if that's a minute later you did a one minute fast however metabolically physiologically that means nothing a fast metabolically and physiologically has value when it has been about 72 to 96 hours in duration I don't suggest longer than the 96 hours without really close supervision given by someone competent, mm. such as myself. And I don't call anything less than 72 hours. Even That's not even fasting. It's just not eating. Fair. So one meal a day <laughs> is just nowhere near fasting. It's just eating once a day, which is what you should do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so even if you have hunger signals throughout the day, maybe just chill out on that and just wait until like, if do, should you kind of have like a predetermined time or should you rely on your hunger signals? Well, yeah, you, do. you, you work eat. out when your hunger signals peak during the day normally, because in a 24 hour period, there'll be one point where your hunger is at its highest level. For me, it happens to be around yeah. about four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. So I eat my meal at around about four o'clock when that's possible, which is most days. And I eat sufficient food in that one meal to be enough food for the next 24 hours until I next eat 4 p.m. the next day. And I don't mm. have hunger signals in between because I have sufficient nutrition what? on board. And because I haven't poisoned myself with things that make me feel hungry before I should. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's that not a problem. Is one That is one thing that I have noticed is like, like I don't feel the need to eat at all throughout the day. I don't, I'm not thinking about food. I'm not like using food as, as a distraction. It's just like, I'll, I'll train, I'll work. 
you know, I have a pretty strenuous job in terms of how much I'm responsible for. I help people with marketing and advertisement campaigns and I'm running a gazillion different things, you know, for my, for my work. And, you know, I'm just, I'm not feeling like oh, I need like a bite to eat to keep me going through the day. I'm like, I'm just going. And then, you know, I eat like a pound and a half, two pounds of meat in the evening and I'm like, good to go. I wake up the next morning feeling energized. Like it's, I, again, this is like one of these things that it's like, has it always just been this easy to feel this good? Because if so, I'm kind of annoyed that it took me this long to actually implement, you know, everyone's, you know, it's like one of these things that you, you almost have cognitive dissonance because you're so indoctrinated by the other ideas of carbohydrate metabolism of, you know, well, balanced diets and whatever it happens to be, or, or even the psychological attachments to like everyone who I, who I've said, it's like, Oh, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing carnivore for at least a hundred days. Mm -hmm. They're like, Oh, I could, uh, that sounds great, but I could never give up fruit. I just like fruit too much. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, they have this attachment to this food, but what I'm fine. And, and I had that reluctance too, or it's like, huh, I really do enjoy apples. I do enjoy cherries in the summer, but like within the first week, I already don't care. <laughs> Like I feel so good and I'm enjoying my food and I don't think about food at all. It's almost like my body is not like giving me these weird false hunger signals all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't care. It's really, really fascinating. Yeah. It's almost as if we're supposed to eat that way. Oh yeah, that's right. Almost. We are. <laughs> so, Bart, I know you have multiple channels. I know there are some that, you know, you have the, the meat militia. I know you have your, your sort of more clean channel in terms of where people can find you and where you want people to find you. What are the best sources to check your work out more? Right. If you go to my main channel, which is that one there, Bart K health science, uh, you can probably find that from YouTube. It's, uh, at professor, K's main channel, something like that. You'll find it. Um, all my various channels on various different topics are listed in the show notes under pretty much every one of my videos. So you'll find them all there. I'd suggest go and sub to the lot. Um, the style is slightly different on the different channels. Some are, are more humorous. Some are more sweary. Some are more professional. My main channel is kind of a mix of things just to kind of give people the, the cross pollination of it. Um, get into it. There's, there's something there for children of all ages over 18, of course. <laughs> and again, guys, I would highly recommend like when he says, go binge watch all of his content. It's, it's a good use of your time. It's entertaining, but it's also extremely educational. I've learned more about nutrition and physiology just through binge watching his stuff than I have like in a long time. And I was, I've been obsessed with nutrition for the last 15 years. So it's, it's a worthwhile investment. Bart, thank you so much for jumping on this conversation with me. I learned so much and I'm just, again, so grateful for your time. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. My pleasure. My privilege to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Just come and sub to all my stuff and hit the bell icon so that YouTube will fail completely to advise you when I <laughs> post new material. Um, Anything that you feel safe to share on your social medias, some of my more professional stuff perhaps, do so. That'd be great. Make sure you hit the like um, icon on my videos when you watch them and, um, you know, write a comment. Al Gore loves his rhythms or something like that underneath the <laughs> video. And uh, all of those things help increase my penetration. Because what I'm really trying to do is educate the general public by subterfuge because people don't want to be educated, I've found. They want to be mm -hmm. one of amused or um, offended. So I'm trying to do both. And then you sneak <laughs> in the education under the radar. You will learn stuff. See you, see you over there. Which I love. And by the way, I do get notified for every one of your videos that comes out and premieres. So uh, YouTube nice. is at least doing their job. On my on my mobile notifications, yours, that, that okay. is not for everybody. Mine, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> High priority notifications, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Art of Fuel. You can find me on Instagram at Anthony dot M A N U E L E. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you're listening on Spotify. Please uh, know that we are also doing video now. So if you just clicked it and you turned it off, well, we got video 
going on. So watch the videos. If you're on iTunes, I don't know why you're still listening to Apple Podcasts. We got video on YouTube and video on Spotify. So go watch it on one of those. Thank you again. And thank you, Bart, for this amazing conversation. We'll catch you guys next time on the next episode of The Art of Fuel.